Welcome back, Generals. This is the Battle of Crampton's Gap and the Union Campaign. I'm Major General Difficulty in version 1.28.4 of the JMP mod. Remember when you could bring a bunch of rifled artillery to the battle and destroy everything as your infantry made their way up the hill? Well, that's not really feasible anymore. The battle's shorter and rifled guns do less damage, so now you need to get your infantry moving early and support them with smooth bores. But before we get started, I want to say thank you for taking the time to check out any of my materials related to the game. I hope you find something to help you achieve success in your own campaigns. Do not hesitate to ask questions in the comments. Be aware that Colonel, Brigadier General, and Major General difficulties all share an AI profile. Legendary has its own profile. Therefore, things that you see me do should easily translate to lower difficulties but may not work in Legendary or be suboptimal. My two points from Second Bull Run went into training. I won't add any more points to training until I complete Fredericksburg. Eight in training gives me four points per stat that I can potentially get from training. It moves the cap up to 28. I have over 40,000 recruits now with stats between 18 and 21. The new recruits received after a battle always have the lowest stats. So if you build up a large recruit pool, the incoming recruits don't water down your stats as much. There are five battles before I get to Fredericksburg, so my recruit stats should be close to the cap of 28 by the time I get there. The number of men that I add for Antietam combined with my losses there will be the primary factors in the actual numbers. I'll then add the final two points to training with the intention that my recruit stats will start hovering around 30 for the second half of the campaign likely slightly decreasing after grand battles and then increasing again after minor battles. I didn't take any politics for this campaign. Obviously, I have plenty of recruits, and I'm also getting to the point in the campaign where extra gold from politics isn't needed either. Not having politics in the early game makes things harder, but if you can live without it, you eventually hit this point where it isn't needed anyway. Of course, that assumes that you are comfortable playing with mid-size or smaller units. If you have your heart set on the behemoth 6,000 man infantry units, then I don't see any way around maxing politics with the default game configuration settings. One thing about maxed recon that sort of goes unnoticed is how it indirectly scales to AI army size in battle. On major general and legendary difficulties, the base weapons recovery is 10%. Maxed recon doubles it up to 20%. With each grand battle, the AI default army size escalates, allowing your 20% coverage to be applied to a larger number. For example, I fought just under 50,000 men at Shiloh, and my base monetary award was just under a quarter million in gold. Well, I'll fight close to 90,000 at Fredericksburg, but the base monetary war reward is 216,000 gold. The monetary and recruit rewards generally increase with each grand battle, but not at the same rate as recon because it's based on the number of enemies that you kill or capture. Once you start facing 150,000 men or more at Gettysburg, it gets pretty crazy. I haven't spent any reputation points since Second Bull Run. For now, I'm just putting together the minimum number of units that I need to fight the next two battles. I will likely take the Lorenzes along with Meade and Burnside when I fill out my ranks for Antietam. I don't need any more medium artillery. I have 52 Napoleons sitting in my armory now. I have plenty of cav weapons. I wish I had some more long-range skirmisher weapons. If I take the Lorenzes with rep points, that will give me a total of 15,000. So it's not like I'm hurting for resources now. I do have a process that I follow after every major battle. First, I check how many officers are in my barracks that have recovered from wounds, and I decide which ones to put back into their unit. I then do a full review of each unit type, starting with infantry, then artillery, then cav, then skirmishers, and I decide if any of them need to be merged into another group or are disbanded completely. I then prioritize which units will get my veterans. In this case, I selected the 12 units that I'll take to Crampton's Gap. I put placeholder generals into the second and third corps commander slots because I want to take my major generals to the battle for the XP. 
Since rifled artillery is the safest place for them, I gave my avatar Loomis's battery and Gibbon Peabody's battery. Wagner, as my only lieutenant general, is the Corps commander. Brown has 1st Division with Brewster, McDowell, and my avatar. Harlan has 2nd Division with Brooks, McClellan, and Gibbon. U.S. Grant has 3rd Division with Porter, Sherman, and Walton. Lomax has 4th Division with Woods, Grimes, and Reed. The AI was reinforced by a full corps and a training focus. The AI Army is the same size as it was before Second Bull Run. The Armory has increased 1% and training has jumped up 9%. The AI has 15,776 men and 44 guns, plus whatever it'll get from unit splits. I have 12,700 men and 60 guns. In the past, I would have placed rifled guns on the field first and shelled the AI until most of its artillery are gone. Then I'd start my invasion once my reinforcements arrived. As previously stated, with the shortened mission timer and artillery doing less damage, it's harder to make that strategy work. So, I will get my infantry and smoothbore started immediately. My reinforcements will arrive at 1130. The sight lines are poor on this map, so be prepared to send skirmishers in for better spotting. This is going to be a grinded out type of battle. It is super rare to fully clear this battle on major general difficulty now. Your cav don't have room to maneuver, and with your damage penalties and heavy cover, Melee calves struggle to quickly handle them in the woods. The AI tends to have its snipers on the far left of the screen. It will have some infantry on the right side, but it rarely crosses the water, so it's easy to approach from the right side. My infantry and smoothbores in the middle will anchor the attack and deal with any charging units that come down. I purposely did not top off Walton's artillery unit because he would lose a star so he has 280 men rather than the 300. It might end up costing me a gun or two, but I have six more 24-pounders sitting in my armory to replace any losses. I tend to get my smoothbores right up behind my infantry. As long as Walton himself isn't killed or wounded, I'm not going to worry about any guns that he loses.
Many historical strategy games are turn-based, so some players pick up Ultimate General Civil War and are unfamiliar with basic real-time strategy games. You don't want to engage everyone one-on-one -on -one in an RTS when you're in a shootout like this. That's how you end up maximizing your casualties to your own troops. You see the five AI infantry on the defensive line? I have three infantry and three detached skirmishers in my line. I do not want to be firing on all five AI units simultaneously and spreading out my fire. Doing so will result in both sides just shooting each other to pieces. In an RTS, you want to focus as much firepower as possible on just one or two targets at a time to make them rout or destroy them. Each time that you rout one of them, that's fewer units that are firing back at you. So instead of 6 versus 5, it becomes 6 versus 4, then 6 versus 3, and so on. The AI will bring more units forward until it runs out, but you reduce the number of enemies damaging your units by working this strategy. My guys are too spread out to fire all on one unit, so I'll focus on two of them. The exception will be if one or more charges me, and then I'll switch my fire to the charging unit. My reinforcements have arrived. I will send my snipers up the left side to deal with the AI snipers. My artillery batteries will be set up in the open to support and avoid any damage penalties. My other infantry units will head up the right side to cross the river and flank from the right.
If I can push the AI sniper out of cover and control this observation point, it'll allow my snipers to flank from the left. It's a little tight on timing, but if you can keep the pressure on and forcing the AI units back, you'll get to the VP before time expires. More AI units are being pushed back out of the cover. Firing on them in the open will significantly boost the amount of damage that they're taking.
AI guns will be within range soon, and taking them out will help reduce how much damage I'm taking. Walton's gonna lose a second gun soon, but he's hanging in there fresh and heroic. I can fire on his artillery batteries now.
cutting it close now. I need these two 600 band infantry units that are closest to me on each side of the VP to route. Then I can easily surge forward to take the VP. turned off firing for my units and will run them forward to flip the VP. However, you could have also just picked out targets to charge to close the distance to the VP and it accomplished the same thing. There we go. Now I can turn the firing back on and stop my units. I had 709 men killed, 1,960 wounded, and 310 missing. The AI had 8,176 casualties.
Brewster made it to Lieutenant General. Woods and Brooks both made it to Major General. Thank you so much for spending some of your valuable time watching today. I hope you found something useful for your campaign, and I wish you much success, Generals.